So good evening uh, and welcome to the next in series uh, from the ASGBI webinar. Uh, this evening's event is sponsored by Ethicon. We've taken a slightly different uh, tilt this evening looking at health and wellbeing in the operating theatre. And uh, just to please our Twitter fans, we've purposely um, uh, organised that we've got three Jonathans speaking to you tonight. So there's a tick in the box for the health and uh, inclusivity and diversity people. Uh, ASGBI Association founded in 1920, uh, a great organisation uh, encompassing all aspects of general surgery, hopefully inclusive uh, and uh, allowing us all to meet and discuss things which are important to us. Next slide, please. So a couple of things to let you know about is that we've got the Moynihan Academy coming up, uh, a new and exciting opportunity for trainees interested in general surgery. Uh, formal launch is due at our first ever fully virtual congress, uh, which takes place on the 4th to the 8th of May. Uh, we're hoping this is going to be an exciting and action-packed congress. We've already had over a thousand abstracts submitted. So trainees that are involved in, uh, in the audience this evening, I hope that you'll look out for the Moyne Had Academy when it launches uh, in May. So we've uh, sent out a Twitter poll. We've had some quite interesting uh, results back over the last 48 hours or so. Uh, and essentially, you're all aware that now more than ever, it's important for us all to take uh, care of our mental and physical well-being. Next slide, please. It's obvious that all of us at some point, or certainly the majority of us at some point, coming up to 80% have experienced back pain, neck pain, either during or after we've had an operating list. Next slide. Uh, most of us have experienced some work-related stress or anxiety. Next slide. Uh, but very few of us in, uh, in reality actually follow any form of exercise regime, uh, either physical or mental, professional or self-directed to help us deal with those issues. Next slide, please. First speaker this evening is Jonathan Daniel, he's a physiotherapist who started his career doing sports medicine, working from the Welsh Rugby Union team, working at the Hong Kong Seven. In 2003, uh, opened his own company called Fitback, uh, which is a specialist in occupational physiotherapy, I'm looking at back pain and neck pain. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sonia, for the introduction. Um, at this point, everyone should feel that they feel the need to sit up straight as uh, when I normally walk into a room, everyone's posture suddenly changes. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction. I'm a physiotherapist of 22 years. I'm still a practicing physio, although I do think I'm getting fairly good at it now, but I'm still practicing. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but I have been in theatre on a number of occasions during my training, um, really just looking at the terrible postures that some surgeons get into, thinking I wouldn't be wanting to work work in those positions for a long period of time. I normally speak for an hour, half a day, a full day on this subject. So cramming it into 12 minutes is gonna be a bit of a challenge and for me to shut up in that time. But the idea of today is just to talk through in some of my experience, um, to pass it on to you, to encourage you to become a bit more active and to avoid these positions that you might be getting in for long periods. Um, our bodies are designed to bend, twist and turn. We don't like static positions for any long periods of time even if we're sat in the world's most expensive, comfortable ergonomic chair, if we sit in a, in a good posture for a long time, we're gonna start getting aching and pain and getting aches and pains in different joints. Our bodies, if the bodies are overused and perform repetitive movements in static positions, we, we don't like this. And typically through everyday life and the things we do, we tend to adopt a very much flexed posture. And when I say flexed, hunched over in this position every day when we get up, we're spending time sitting down, eating our breakfast. We get up, we drive to work. In the days we used to drive to work, um, performing surgery, again, you're adopting those flex positions. Um, and we very, very rarely extend our bodies. And it's, it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science. If we spend all time in one position, those muscles at the front, so all the, um, the um, anterior muscles become tight and stiff and shortened. And the muscles at the posterior aspect around the back, around the legs, become long and weak, and we can get basically muscle imbalance caused as well. Spending time in a flex position, particularly around the neck, and I know what the type is around back pain, but this is a whole kind of body that we're looking at, we can get cervical dysfunction as well. And if we're not extending and moving our spines in a normal range of movement, going through all the different available movements, 
we are going to end up with segmental dysfunction. And we often see problems in the low cervical um, going into the thoracic region and presenting as um, thoracic outlet and things like pins and needles and tingling in the hands as well, where we're compressing our, our brachial plexus nerves. We end up getting tight pecs. Uh, we end up getting neck flexor shortening um, and also ending up in lots of trigger points at the base of our neck. Um, I'm going to go on and show you an exercise uh, video towards the end, um, just to, um, we're going to hopefully get you all out of the chair and get you up and moving around if you're physically able to do that. It's coming towards the end of the day, so we've either all been uh, operating or we've been sat in a chair, and hopefully some of you would have got out and moved around. The common areas that we see problems, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably uh, telling you things you already know in your, in your profession, is um, tight shoulders, so round shoulder posture. Um, compression and um, potentially um, problems with the shoulder, rotator cuff muscles where we're getting impingement as well. Very, very common um, in uh, professions where you spend a lot of time in a flex posture is thoracic outlet and this can present as tingling pins and needles and weakness, weakness in the arms. A very, very simple solution for this when we spend all the time in the flex position would be just to extend. And now as I've done that, I've click, click, clicked in my sternum and in my thoracic spine I haven't done as, as many stretches as, as possible. For those of you who are sat in your chairs now, just have a little stretch, just stretch out and bend your hands back as well. And just feel, you can feel the neural tension down your arms and it's really, really uncomfortable. This is always worse, kind of worse and more painful when you do this first thing in the morning. But this is a really nice stretch, can, can be simply adopted throughout your, the, your, your time in surgery. A really nice exercise for your neck, which is when you spend a lot of time in the flex position, is to do something called cervical retraction and extension. So in that position, you're just giving yourself a double chin. So if you just tuck your chin in, hold that there, and then look up, at, look up to the ceiling at the same time, it feels a really, really strange opposite um, movement to do. In the first few repetitions, it feels like your head's gonna fall off the back of your head, uh, back of your neck. But what this does, it helps to um, improve the cervical curve and helps to get the and reduce any segmental problems. And this is a really, really effective exercise for reducing headaches, pain, pain at the back of the head. And if you just perform that 10 or 15 times, you'll find that your movement increases and it also feels more comfortable. And as you can, if you can build that into your daily, daily kind of routine to stretch, then this can be really, really beneficial as well. <clears throat> for me, it's all about changing postures on a regular basis. So if you're sat in, in a chair all day, for example, or your muscles become short and we are actually in danger of becoming somewhat chair shaped. So it's about extending, changing postures on a regular basis. So if you spend all day, all, all day in, in theatre, for example, it, it could be anything from an hour for a small procedure, potentially up to six or seven hours, maybe longer for the more complex ones, is to take regular breaks and have a stretch and change postures. I'm going to move back away from my screen because we're going to play the video in a short while. And um, the exercises we're going to be looking at, the first one is marching on the spot. And it's just a simple flexion in for the hips and knees um, to, to avoid it. So we're spending a lot of time in that flex position. This changes the position of the hip and pelvis. We're then going to move on to squats. And this is a great way for activating the quads and the calf muscles to increase the pumping of the blood around the body. We're going to go on to calf raises. And we all know that the calves are uh, the main, main muscle pump in the lower limbs. This is a, a really good way of increasing blood circulation for those of you who've been standing around and maybe suffering from swollen ankles. We're then going to go on to do some thoracic rotation and rotation is one of the movements that we always forget about doing. So you may spend all the time flexing and extending over your patients, but very rarely is there a need to do um, rotation in the, in the thoracic region. Also forgotten muscles are the QL muscles, quadratus lumborum. And so just stretching those regularly will help to reduce back pain. And a really, really common cause of back pain is tightness in the QL muscles around the base of the back. We're then going to do some extension because we spend all day in this position in surgery. We need to be extending back as well to put our lumbar spine and thoracic spine into extension. Then the shoulders. We're going to do a nice stretch and opening up the brachial plexus and the pecs muscles to stretch back. Then we're going to go on to cervical range of movement up and down, side to side, left and right. And then we're going to go on to the last exercise, which is our upper limb neural stretch which is absolutely brilliant. So I've talked you through those exercises. If you feel as if you're unable to do any of those then just stay put where you are or join in with those that you can. 
So for the last few minutes, if we could play that video, it's got some music to go with it as well. Push it, stand up, push your chair back, try not to fall over or injure yourself. If you do feel any discomfort whilst you're doing this, just ease off. But if you all want to have a go, that'd be great to see everyone join in. Can we have the volume as well, please? <clears throat> I don't see any of the panellists stood up, by the way. Could you get out of your chairs, please? So each of these exercises is going to last about 15 seconds, 20 seconds. to go all the way down, he's pretty flexible as Gareth. Okay, and this is the last exercise. So 
particularly good exercise for any arm pain, tingling, pins and needles, any kind of neural pain, tightness around the top of the chest. It's a brilliant exercise. Thank you. That's the end of the slides. And that's 12 minutes and 30 seconds. So I'll, uh, I better end there before I get told off. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Five minutes of that, we're just doing some exercises and I think we can all agree, hopefully you're going to feel a little bit more relaxed, a little bit looser in the neck and the lower back, particularly if you've been working. I'm, uh, I'm assured that Professor Anderson has done some deep squats in his living room, so if uh, Professor Anderson can get down, the rest of them I'm sure uh, can do it. I also think that some nice relaxing music going along with that is probably helping with our mindfulness. Uh, and with our well-being in general. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kirsty Williams. She is a highly specialised uh, psychologist. She's got 30 years of experience. Uh, her area of expertise is usually in cancer therapy for the patients dealing with bad diagnoses. But over the last 12 months, she's been working with the COVID response team in a local hospital, providing support for colleagues uh, who have struggled uh, with COVID. So I'd like to listen to Kirsty. Tell us how to look after your mind. Good evening, everybody. Um, really nice to be with you this evening. I asked some um, colleagues, having never done a presentation to surgeons before, they suggested if we could move on to the next slide, um, that it might be useful to start with a joke. They said surgeons appreciate a joke. So I put one out there that might just that might just resonate at this moment in time. Next slide, please. I wanted to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of surgeons and took a little, little, a little bit of a look at the research that's come from 2020. Um, the current medical crisis, if we could move through this, the slides, please, lovely, has been an unexpected global challenge for all of us. And as we can imagine, it's evicted many of us from what would feel like comfortable and normal routines for us all. One of the things, next slide, please. One of the things about the current uh, crisis is it, re it requires not only the entire population to engage with what's going on at present, but it also means that clinicians, particularly surgeons who are in more senior roles, are expected to assume broad leadership. Um, and as we would sort of know, there's generally an expectation from surgeons that they will be at their best at all times, which is something of a, a big expectation in a, in a situation that's uh, constantly unfolding or has been certainly at the start of this. Next slide, please. Um, and what we know is that generally, most initial physicians, when they're asked about their sort of general wellness, they will say that that comes from a sense of personal accountability, a sense of being able to practice in ways that they feel are competent, moral, and uh, that fit with their sort of, uh, you know, social schemas. So there's been a lot at the moment about the sort of COVID-19 crisis that has basically challenged the status quo for many of uh, our medical colleagues and surgeons in particular. The most recent BMA survey, and I was looking, I was uh, really curious about the results of the polls uh, at the start of this evening um, in 2020, said that they found that 41% of doctors were struggling with depression, anxiety, stress, and burnout, um, that they felt uh, was being made worse generally by their work. And 29% of the polls stated that as a result of the ongoing crisis and pandemic situation, that they felt that this had deteriorated significantly. So in some ways, quite worrying statistics, really, in terms of the impact of um, just generally the, you know, the work that we do, but also then the uh, overlay of the current crisis situation. Next slide, please. And my apologies for perhaps the pronunciation, but Balasubranamia uh, and et al. in 2020 looked at the main factors that surgeons in a poll um, suggested were affecting their mental well-being. The suggestion was that many people related that they had been seeing people dying at a rate that they'd never really experienced before. And for many surgeons, they had been displaced from their normal roles and put into unfamiliar situations. More remote reviews were happening with patients. And as, a, and as such, there was a lot, a lot of uh, uh, grief for the lack of physical and humor human interaction that would normally happen with patients and, and that many people felt, um, you know, conferred a degree of 
emotional relief that 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 capacity to sort of deal one to one with your patients and actually to see families actually was part of the the, the way that many people felt that they coped with their jobs. Some of the surgeons have been uh, talked about being sort of displaced into very, very unfamiliar roles and uh, started to talk about the sense of their, their vulnerability, really. And also the other thing that was quite interesting that were people were asked about what actually, um, you know, motivated them to become surgeons and do their work. And they said, you know, it was actually about the opportunity to be able to help people um, and to make a difference. And actually for many colleagues who perhaps as a result of the restrictions and, uh, you know, their own physical health problems, perhaps those that were shielding were really struggling with the fact that they were unable to work um, and therefore the impact that that was having on their colleagues. Next slide, please. So we looked a little bit at some of the qualitative research about what, what people were actually saying in terms of the impact that they felt the pandemic was actually having on them as people. I signed up to be a doctor, but my family didn't choose this career path. I feel like I forced the risk on them in some ways, and I just feel I can't get away from the guilt of that. I feel I've aged considerably over the last three months with variable le levels of anxiety and stress. It's been a real roller coaster of emotions whilst trying to continue to practice safely and also to protect my staff. Everything at work's just felt so much more frustrating, frustrating and exhausting. Every day at times has felt like wading through treacle. The fatigue after wearing PPE all day cannot be underestimated. It impacts on what I physically and mentally feel that I could do after a shift at work. And just a few sort of examples there of sort of colleagues who've talked about the impact of uh, the way that we're working now and the, and the fact that they're feeling that this is having a, a detrimental impact on their mental health. Next slide, please. One of the things that we know from our jobs generally is that they, the work that we do Anybody that works, you know, in the face of intense human suffering has, uh, we know that that can have an impact on our inner lives and, and our sense of self. And actually, one of the things that has come from the research around the pandemic is the, is the, is the sense of vicarious trauma, that, that almost on a daily basis, physicians are being witness to either personal crises in their own lives, in the lives of their families, but also in the impact that that's having on patients and patients' families. And one of the things that McCann and Perlman talk a lot about that in terms of uh, vicarious trauma, which has the capacity to sort of completely alter in our internal framework of the world, is that we are starting to sort of question fairly well established sort of the you know, constructs that we've held about life and, and actually coming back and starting to question those. Next slide, please. So what might we notice if we are uh, as a result of the things that we're being exposed to, both in our working lives, both in terms of the media coverage, both in terms of the impact on family and friends and colleagues, is that vicarious trauma will play out in a, in a number of ways. Um, there's a sense often of feeling quite fearful, and that for many people who usually uh, have a sort of sense of control and autonomy over what they do may not be a, a very normal feeling at all. Um, Helplessness being common, that actually where you would normally be able to execute a solution or find a solution or do something, often there's a sense of not always being fully in control of our experience. And also the other thing as well is that sort of sense of, of often being in the role of an unobserver. So rather than being able to actually execute a solution and follow that through, many clinicians are describing that they're having to almost sit back and watch some of these things happening and feel powerless to sort of make change about that. What we know about vicarious trauma, which if left un, un sort of treated or that we don't do anything about that, it often leads on to the more significant uh, career changing things like compassion fatigue and then eventually burnout where, where people end up sort of getting to the point where they feel either empathically numb or so overwhelmed with the experience of others that they actually find themselves withdrawing from the profession. And the other thing that's really important to note in this, given that currently we're actually in it, uh, and we're in the middle of this situation, it's, it's yet to pass, is that the psychological processing of any sort of traumatic experiences that we witness is often a very latent thing. 
So we're sort of the lights are on more often than not, but the actual, you know, the actual felt experience of that in terms of what we what we think and we feel about it is often going to come much further down the line. Next slide, please. This is a lovely slide by a, a lovely guy called Matthew Johnson, who's written a, a, a book for health professionals, but also patients on the impact of, uh, you know, uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and he writes cartoon books for adults. And I just thought this was a lovely statement, really, that over 24 hours, we process up to 70,000 thoughts. Um, and that this is basically the brain never shuts up. Um, and as you'll probably all be aware, you know, we are from an evolutionary perspective, hardwired to be pretty pessimistic. So actually put us in a pessimistic context where there is an omnipresent threat, then most of the time we're sort of operating on a fairly high level of alert, which is absolutely exhausting, um, as, as most people are probably be aware. Next slide, please. So we've got to a psychological bit. Firstly, it's okay not to be okay, so I'll be a little bit sloughed and fluffy with that. I think it's true to say that most of us like a degree of certainty. Um, we get our internal sense of feeling safe by a sense that we're largely in control of our experience, choices, decisions, albeit that this is a slightly naive stance, really. It's an intellectualization of how we feel safe. COVID however, is one of the examples that suddenly wobbled our sort of preferred status quo. It's put us into situations where we may suddenly be experiencing an awful lot of uncertainty and loss of autonomy, and we're feeling a sort of sense of feeling unsafe and uncertain, unsafe psychologically because of the amount of uncertainty that's around us. And actually that uh, often results in a good dollar for what we might refer to as existential angst. Who am I? Where am I? What am I? What am I doing? What's the point of this? Where are we going? So one of the things that we habitually strive to do is to put the certainty back. Um, so we will look to try to put things back, maintain the status quo. And a lot of uh, our medical colleagues at the moment are saying, actually, that's really difficult because that's not possible. Or we put it back, but it, it's an incredibly fragile construct. It's not something that actually stays particularly stable. So it looks similar to how it used to. We think we're getting back to normal. But internally, there's still that huge sense of vulnerability because it just doesn't feel quite right. So we're psychologically unsafe with the perceived certainty that we put back. So the thing that we're going to try and work for in the last little bit of the presentation today is, is to see if we can orientate ourselves to a place that might have greater psychological resilience. So that is ostensibly trying to find a way that we can feel safe enough, grounded, rooted within the inevitable uncertainty that is just a given, a given in life, a given certainly with a global pandemic, and actually just is, is it was always thus really. And so the idea is that we're going to see if we can find that, that psychological rootedness, that groundedness within ourselves. So it only took me to slide nine as a psychologist to bring in the concept of mindfulness, which I think is quite good. I fooled you all of that way along. So I'm just going to put the next slide up. Um, and I know that um, I, my lovely colleagues here have assured me that this, this presentation is available afterwards. So these are sort of some qualitative, de quant quantitative details I thought would be good um, for a group of surgeons that might just actually validate why mindfulness might be quite helpful. So if we could uh, put the next slide, please. So we know that surgeons are, are required to maintain their presence of mind in the, in the setting of challenging physical and mental tasks. Next slide, please. And one of the things, now I'm told this, and I'm not making a judgment as a psychologist, that actually personality traits such as perfectionism, intensity, which might have actually facilitated success in the competitive environment of training to be a surgeon, you know, that, that sort of really competitive race to get very, very highly eligible places may also be that sort of Achilles heel later on and may manifest themselves as intolerance, impatience, contributing to frustration and anger, particularly if we feel that we're not able to sort of uh, get, have that, that on autonomy and control that we might be used to. Next, please. So what we know, and apparently evidence tells us, is that mindfulness meditation practices can actually be really, really useful to cultivate um, in our lives as surgeons or in, in the work that you do, um, because it doesn't in any way diminish the motivation 
but it allows us to practice that, cultivate that opportunity to be able to respond to what it is that we're experiencing as opposed to being reactionary to that. So I'm just going to put up another, if we just follow that slide through, there's a little couple more bits of information there. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next slide in terms of talking a little bit about mindfulness. So what we know is that a lot of the time in our sort of the way that we uh, interact with the world is that more often than not, we're sort of going through the motions, we're on, we're on autopilot. So the whole point of introducing a mindfulness practice isn't to necessarily stop thinking, it's just to be more aware of the fact that we are thinking and then to notice that and come back to the object of our awareness so that we're much more likely to be able to respond to our experience rather than react. And in times where our threat response is heightened, as it is currently, that's quite a good thing to be able to, a skill to be able to hone. Next slide, please. And as we know, when we're stressed, we can't see the wood for the trees. Um, we're quite reactionary in terms of the, uh, the things that we might do. And that means that we become quite habitual, really, so that we go through the day uh, in very rarely present to our own experience. So we're sort of going through the motions. And actually, the difficulty with that is, is that a lot of the sort of habitual, stressful thoughts, inherent worries, long players, as I would call them, in terms of our sort of uh, bet noir and Achilles heel, are often sort of there just at the point of consciousness. Next slide, please. So we know that as human beings, we're not made of Teflon, unfortunately, and that actually our emotional world or the world itself has the capacity to sort of um, get a bit stuck to us by the end of the day. We sort of collect all of this stuff. So one of the things that I often encourage, which is a really, really simple thing to do, is to introduce a little bit of emotional punctuation into our day. If you've ever read, uh, there's, a, there's a book called Old Country, uh, for old men and the whole book is written without any punctuation at all very very good as a as a novel but exhausting to read uh because the whole thing just just flows one after another after another and that's often how we live our lives particularly if we're in a situation that's unprecedented so just want to suggest that we might introduce the pause and that's a really really simple thing that i'm going to suggest that we introduce as an exercise each day so next slide please the idea being that we make just a commitment to stop three times a day. Sometimes you might put a little warning on the computer. Sometimes you might actually put a little, uh, you know, a, an alarm on your phone. And as we come to the pause, all we have to do is just for a moment stop and bring the awareness to something that's very present in that moment. It might be a raindrop coming down the window pane, might be sipping a glass of water. It might be, if it's all right with you, just coming to a moment-by-moment moment awareness of the breath. And then as a result of just noticing that, just being sort of present for a few moments with something that's happening in the moment and now, we just allow the awareness to settle. Once we've done that for two or three breaths, watching the rain drop make its way down to the end of the window pane, the encouragement then is just to allow the awareness to broaden out again. No more difficult, no more complex than that. And actually, if we look at the empirical, the empirical evidence for introducing is something as simple as that during the course of the day, then actually the benefits of it are, 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 are quite significant. Do we move on to the next slide, please, if that's okay? Thank you. And next one, sorry. <laughs> and the next slide. So mindfulness for busy people, a lot of people say to me, actually, you know, I'm, I'm busy, I can't do this mindfulness stuff, I can't be sitting in a Zen position with me, legs crossed, you know, just staring at my navel for four hours, I've got a job to do. Um, more often than not, the best mindfulness practices is to bring them into your everyday. So I had a lovely chat with a doctor the other day, he was saying to me, I just can't be doing with it, you know, I just haven't got the time, I'm too busy. And I said to him, well, can you bring mindfulness into having a pee? You know, as you stand over the uh, as you stand over the loo and you're peeing into the water, just be aware of the you know aware of the wee hitting the water, aware of the fact of whether you know water comes up. Just actually bring awareness to the activity that you're doing, rather than mindlessly having a wee and thinking about a million and one other things. So it's actually very very simple to bring very basic mindfulness practice into our daily routine, and and that in and of itself can be enormously helpful to sort of manage our well being. 
Okay, next slide, please. I'm conscious of time, so sorry if I'm rushing a bit. I just want to tell you a really brief story before we finish. Said quick. Um, I also heard a stereotypical response that, that a lot of people in surgery like golf as well. So I'll try and marry it with golf. Um, there's a lovely story about the development of a golf course in Calcutta. They wanted to develop the most prestigious golf course going. Um, so they set up this golf course. It was wonderful, beautiful fairways, beautiful, beautiful environment. And they invited all of the most prestigious golfers from all over the world to come and play. Went down really well, except for one problem, that every time anybody teed off, the monkeys would come and nick the balls. Um, and obviously that didn't go down very well at all. So they thought, right, we're going to have to do something about this. They built walls around the golf course to try to stop the monkeys invading and coming over and nicking the balls. Unfortunately, monkeys climbed, so they still got on the fairways, they still nicked all the balls. They tried to lure the monkeys away with sort of veg and sort of mangoes and fruit and things like that. Monkeys thought this was great. They brought more monkeys. They brought their mates to try and nick these as well. Didn't work. Eventually, they tried to ship the monkeys away with the van and, and see if they could relocate them equally. Really difficult because the one colony of monkeys moved out and a new one came in. So they sat there and thought, we're going to have to do something about this. What can we do? So they decided that they would create a novel rule for the golf course. They sat the golfers down and they told the golfers that they would need to play the ball from where the monkey dropped it. This did not go down very well, as you can imagine, for people who were trained a long time to play golf, play golf well, they were used to doing that. And actually the idea being that life's always dropping our balls, isn't it, where we don't want them. And maybe the challenge in this global pandemic, maybe the challenge as a result of the experiences that you might have had through this time, might be about seeing whether or not you can take up the challenge and play the balls from where the monkeys have dropped them. Let's see. Thanks for listening today. Chair Steve, thank you. That's been brilliant. And I think it's a lot of food for thought. Um, and Chris did mention earlier that all these uh, videos and uh, references will be available in the members hub from the ASGBI website early next week. Um, I processed 84,000 thoughts while you were doing that talk. Um, and I'm sure plenty of other people have too. But uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a QA and a um, chat facility. So if anyone's got any questions for Jonathan or for Kirsty, towards the end of the meeting, we'll uh, hopefully be able to air those for them. So please start getting involved. And we've, we've thought about our health and well-being. There's things that we don't have much control over. There are hazards in our operating theatre uh, that we can't do without. Um, one of which is surgical smoke, and I think Hannah Carson Boyd is going to uh, Boyd Carson, sorry Hannah, uh, <laughs> is going to um, give us a quick overview about the evidence at the moment, minute talking about surgical smoke and how it affects our health. Thanks, Hannah. Good evening, everybody. Next slide, please, Vicky. Um, so just as Sonia said, a few brief slides just about surgical smoke and the potential impact on our health. Um, probably an image that most of us are very uh, used to seeing. Um, surgical smoke is the gaseous byproduct which is produced when the tissue is dissected or cauterized by heat generating devices, which as we probably most commonly are familiar with is the diathermy in general surgery. During the general surgical procedures, the heat from the diathermy causes the target cell membranes to break down and rupture to their boiling point. And this subsequently produces a plume of smoke which mostly contains water vapour that is released into the atmosphere in theatres. The charring of these adjacent cells can also release harmful contaminants, such as carbonized cell fragments and gaseous hydrocarbons. These diathermy emissions have been sampled and analysed, and a number of studies have suggested that they can contain toxic gases, particulates, and as I said, water vapour, which can be usually um, unable to be seen by invisible to the naked eye. The chemicals that are suggested to be in the greatest quantity include hydrocarbons, nitric acids, phenols, fatty acids. But one that's most of a concern is something called acryl nitrile, which is a colourless liquid, liquid that can form hydrogen cyanide, which again, as we all probably know, is potentially carcinogenic to humans. Hydrogen cyanide can also act synergistically with carbon monoxide to impede tissue oxygenation. Next slide, please. So to date, there actually has been limited uh, research and evidence produced regarding what 
um, the risks are. Um, it is important probably to say that the risks do vary depending on individual circumstance. So how long the implement's been using, what implement is being using, such as diathermy or laser, um, and the period of time that is being exposed. It has been suggested that the kind of risks associated with smoke, surgical smoke, can be divided into three main categories. So infectious hazards, direct physical injury, um, or chemical and mutagenic effects. In animal studies, it has been kind of documented that virus cells can be transferred in surgical smoke and that these can cause acute and chronic inhalational um, injury. While, as I say, we have had limited in, um, information and research performed in human studies, it's not unreasonable to suggest that we could be affected in the same way. Additionally, the thing that people probably are most concerned about is the carcinogenic effect on smoke, from smoke on us as surgeons and anaesthetists and all other members of staff in the operating theatre. Again, surgical smoke has been shown to potentially show carcinogenic um, effects in vitro, but not actually again in kind of human studies within theatre. One study did suggest that surgical smoke can be related to the number of cigarettes, as again, commonly people think of surgical smoke and smoking um, as a comparable thing. They suggested that for one gram of tissue, again, I'm not exactly sure what one gram of tissue would relate to, <laughs> but for it being diathermized for 60 seconds, that, that was equivalent to smoking three cigarettes about the amount of uh, smoke that was produced. Um, so that's probably something really to think about. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the evidence about what the risks are, as I said, there was there's not very, very much. <laughs> um, there was a systematic review performed by the Health and Safety Executive in 2012, which again is a few years ago now. Um, and they were specifically looking, or their question specifically was, whether healthcare workers that were exposed to surgical smoke, did they have an increased risk of respiratory compromise? Um, and their systematic review concluded that there was insu insufficient papers and insufficient evidence that were translatable to the UK human population. Um, again, kind of looking at how we can prevent risks, uh, again, limited information. Um, a group of dermatologists uh, from America performed another meta-analysis a bit more recently in 2016. And they basically looked at two risk prevention strategies, so that of masks and then also evacuation devices. They, one of the strategies was comparing simple masks with uh, respiratory valve or FFP3 masks. Um, and not understandably, or um, they suggested that the FFP3 masks were much more significant and effective in obviously reducing evidence and um, damage from surgical smoke. They said that the FFP3s were obviously able to filter sub-micro particles of smoke whereas the surgical, simple surgical masks were all, um, only able to filter particles that were greater than five micrometers. Um, they also said that the main thing was that a proper fitting, fit tested mask was one of the most um, important uh, factors in limiting the damage. As we probably all know, especially with recently in, co in the COVID times, there are multiple smoke evacuation devices that are in use, such as the suction wands and pencils. Again, I, I couldn't find much information or kind of paper published papers regarding the evidence and how effective those are. Um, but really the main thing that was kind of stated was that the airflow needs to be of significant amount to evacuate the smoke. Um, and that needs to be up to greater than uh, 10 meters cubed per second, which again, I don't really know what that means for us as surgeons, <laughs> but essentially make sure that we know we're using the correct, the correct uh, evacuation device. Next slide, please. So to conclude, there isn't much out there about what actually uh, the surgical smoke is doing to us as surgeons, anaesthetists and theatre staff. I think from my reading of it, I think we should really be protecting ourselves with the simple measures. Again, I think with COVID, we're all a bit more used to wearing masks now. Um, and I kind of know personally myself before coronavirus, I probably wasn't wearing a mask as regularly as I should have been, especially with uh, laparoscopic surgery. But I think now that's something that we all should really, really be considering and actually thinking, are we protecting ourselves appropriately from um, these simple things that perhaps we don't understand as much about? Prior to, again, coronavirus, surveys had been undertaken within the surgical population as a whole, which suggested that people weren't using evacuation devices and weren't protecting themselves with masks. And I think that is something that we should, as I say, all consider 
going forward, whether we're actually doing the simple things that can help us. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah. Hannah's going to night shift, so I hope if you're operating tonight, Hannah, you've got a I'll put my mask on. three mask on and, and save yourself. We were hoping that Hannah's uh, talk would run into our uh, sponsor talk from Ethicon, because I think they're going to talk to us about a little bit of the kit and equipment they've got to keep us safe. Uh, but because Hannah's going to go and actually do some work this evening, uh, we've just brought forward. So thank you, Hannah. We'll let you go. See you. Uh, we'll have Jonathan Lewis from Ethicon in just a few minutes' time. But before that, uh, the last people that we need to, or certainly some more people we need to think about in the operating theatre beyond ourselves and our team and the trainees. Uh, I think they've had a pretty rough time in COVID. Uh, and John Mond, who is uh, now the chair of the JCST, is going to tell us uh, a little bit about the evidence that we've got in the last 12 months nearly of how COVID has affected training. Thanks, John. Great. Well, thanks very much, Sonia. Um, just while I share my screen, like what a, what a great uh few talks and um i think uh it really has been useful i've been to a lot of webinars lately and um and um let's get back and start the talk it uh it really is the some of the most useful things i've heard for a long time on any of these things so uh, well done and thanks very much so i was asked um i, I said what should i talk about and I, was, I was told by somebody uh quite senior in uh ASGBI not to do any of the touchy feely stuff because we've got an expert for that and obviously we've seen Kirsty give a great talk uh, on mindfulness etc certainly going to make a difference to my day and um, so I, I was asked to um, tell you some facts about things but uh, hopefully we'll talk about how to look after your trainee it's been a really difficult time as Sonia said everyone's been through a lot trainees have been through uh, more than us because it's much more likely to be redeployed much more likely to be at the sharp end of all this and uh, you know and everyone's had a, a difficult year so we need to start looking after people Hang on. Um, so this is this is what um happened normally uh, people would start training and then have a relatively steady trajectory all the way to cct and then this happened and then this happened and everyone's trajectory for training towards cct got knocked off and, uh, and people people are really starting to wonder when they're, they're going to start making progress again. And we know that logbook numbers are down by about a half compared to 2019. And this, and of course, affects not just the operating areas, but all areas of work, except perhaps emergency care. And it's all regions and all specialties, as I'll show you in a minute. So I think the thing, sort of the theme of this webinar is trainees lead, need good trainers like they never have done before. And if you're a trainer, you need to look after your trainee like you never have done before. So um, here's some um, data that we've got from uh, e-logbook. <clears throat> you can see here that um, electives for general surgery, electric surgeries, uh, electric cases are in blue and emergency cases in red. And it goes back to uh, December 2018 to uh, December 2020. And you can see that everything's ticking along uh, reasonably constantly in the emergency cases. And then COVID starts uh, in March last year, and there's a massive drop off, particularly in elective cases, which never recovered, and then starts to dip again as the third wave hit uh, late in, the, in last year. I've just seen the data today for January, and that curve continues its path downwards. Emergency cases dip for a while, but then return to normal. So a big impact on logbook cases. You can see here the uh, results of ARCP outcomes in 2019 and 2020. The green on the top line, uh, the green are the outcome ones and red any other outcome. And you can see the difference between 2019 and 2020 are those about 20% of trainees who have a COVID outcome, an outcome 10 of some kind. So this is where uh, people haven't made progression to where they should be uh, in, uh, in their level of training because of COVID. And remember that most of the ARCPs are only like three or four months into COVID. So uh, next year's are probably going to be um, significantly worse than that. And if you look at what part of the country is affected, well, no part of the country is spared. This chart shows by uh, region the, the impact of COVID on logbooks. Um, the least affected regions there in pink, it's the Southwest, but still cases are only 60% of the 2019 level. Those in red, so Northern Ireland, the West Midlands are significantly worse affected than 
than the, the southwest, and the rest of the country is no different to southwest. So it's at the very least um, a 40 percent reduction and uh, goes up to 60 percent, uh, 60 to 80 percent reduction in the number of cases recorded in logbooks. So it is a countrywide severe impact on logbook cases. So training is here right in the middle of the biggest storm that it's ever experienced. And we have to remember though, it's not just operative skills. It's easier for us to record operative skills uh, and uh, operative uh, logbook cases, but it's across the board. It's outpatients, it's ward rounds, it's MDT, it's all the areas of working. So 20% of surgical trainees are currently an outcome 10 of some kind. And a third of people at ST7 are on a 10.1 or a 10.2 and 12%, so one in eight trainees at ST8 are an outcome 10.2 so already they've had their training extended because of the impact of Covid in their final year of training. Work done by uh, COPS, the Confederation of Postgraduate Schools of Surgery, suggests that about half of trainees are going to need extension of training. So as we said, the, the front of the trains hit the buffers and what we need to do is take some action right now to prevent the rest of the train crashing into behind and making things even worse than they are. And it's everyone's problem. So that means everyone needs to be part of the solution. Trainees need to be flexible and trace and chase opportunities. Consultants need to involve training uh, in every aspect of patient care and in every patient that they treat. Uh, JCST will continue to collect data and, um, and write derogations to help progression. Employers, it's important to them. Trainees bring in a lot of money for service, the second highest uh, income for any trust is what comes from trainees and also they contribute hugely to income from service and also employers need to be nice to trainees because they want to have uh, trainees in their workforce. If trainees aren't trained at the moment then there will be gaps appearing in the workforce and that will affect uh, employers and, uh, and trusts. Schools and statutory education bodies need to deliver the training. Colleges need to have a word with ministers about providing money to uh, accommodate uh, progression through training. And of course, it's important for the NHS to continue to produce uh, people through CCT to, to occupy gaps in the workforce, gaps that show no sign of decreasing through retirement. And of course, in the end, it's in the interest of patients and the general public. So it's everyone's problem. Everyone needs to be part of the solution. Very early on in the pandemic, uh, the statutory education bodies uh, produced the outcomes 10 for ARCP. And so just to remind you that an outcome 10.1 is equivalent of an outcome 2 ARCP, but a COVID related no fault. It's not your fault that you still have some things to achieve for that stage. And, um, but you, and you don't need extra training time, but there are some things to address. And the 10.2 is equivalent with outcome three, apart from it's not your fault if you have one of these. It just means you, COVID's happened, you haven't had the opportunity, and so you need some extra training time to catch up to get towards CCT. This is the latest uh, derogation that uh, we've agreed with the GMC. It relates to the MRCS. And uh, obviously there have been uh, two or three cancellations of diets of the MRCS and this uh, impacts on people's ability to progress uh, to uh, ST3. So the derogation just agreed says that if you are run through or if you are a CT2 uncoupled trainee, but you've been successful in national selection appointed to ST3, you can proceed to ST3 either with our MRCS if you've already passed it, or if you have attempted or not passed MRCS, or if you've only just registered for the MRCS. And um, and so you can go you can go through without the MRCS. The condition is that you have to pass MRCS before Part B before you can progress to ST4. But that's permissive and allows people to move through their career despite the effects of COVID. These are the other surgery specific derogations. Um, if you're in ST6. Uh, and haven't got all the competence needed for the waypoint for ST6, you can still progress to ST7 uh, with uh, an, a COVID outcome, but you will, that will allow you to apply to sit the FRCS examination. So you won't be held up there because of some technical skills that you haven't quite acquired. And coming to the end of training ST8, we need to keep CCT at the same level as it is now. It's very important both to uh, trainees in their early years as consultants 
and to the general population that people have the same skills that they had in 2019 or 2018 and before. So, but we realise that uh, all courses haven't been available, particularly ATLS and some educational courses. So to get an outcome six, you need to demonstrate that you've achieved competence at that level, but will be able to supply evidence of other forms uh, in other forms other than the certificates for those particular courses and the list of those available on JCST website. There are about four and a half million patients waiting uh, for treatment as a, as a, because of the impact of COVID. And this might be as high as 10 million, according to the latest reports, as there is a, a group of patients who haven't been referred uh, because of COVID. And for us to catch up uh, to where we should be and, uh, and, and ameliorate the impact of COVID, every single one of these patients should have a trainee involved in providing their care and wherever that care is provided be that in the uh, NHS or uh, NHS patients in the independent sector. This is our Twitter campaign you might have seen no training today no surgeons tomorrow it does what it says in the tin if we don't train people properly today there won't we will not have a colleague tomorrow people won't get to CCT and I think I hear from from people oh well you know I'm not really interested in training or I have to catch up trainees slow me down um, I really you know I just have to get on with treating the patients and you know I think it's important for consultants to remember that we we're all trainees once and I think just remember Put yourself in, in their shoes, how you would have wanted to be treated when you were a trainee if this had happened to you. And we have to be active about that training. Learning by osmosis isn't an option. You need to identify the particular learning needs for trainees from the certification guidance and the waypoints, again, available on JCST website, from the outcome uh, narrative of the outcome 10. So it will say on there what the reason for giving the outcome 10 is and what trainees particularly need to catch up on. There's a new version of the multiple consultant report released just today on ISCP. It's going to be really important for trainees to identify their own learning needs through the trainee self-assessment and for also for trainers to be able to identify what the impact of COVID is and perform what's essentially a gap analysis between where trainees are now and where they should be for their time in training through the MCR. I would encourage everybody to do this uh, before it comes into force in August. It's available there um, on, on, uh, on ISCP. Log in and click on the top right hand corner where it says trial MCR. And you will need to actively plan for training in all aspects of the job. So not just theatre, it's easy just to think about operative things, but it's about clinic, it's about the MDT, it's about training on ward rounds to get people back up to speed again. Some people have been redeployed for quite a while and will need some active training to get them up to speed on ward rounds, for instance. And get the most out of every encounter. This is really easy to do. Just have a chat with a trainee beforehand. What are you going to do here? This is what I think you should do. Let's talk about that. What are you going to do? And then afterwards, talk about what they did. It's as easy as that. But good feedback is vital to help people progress as quickly as possible. And just encourage and support your colleagues. So I imagine everyone in the webinar is quite a keen trainer. And But if your colleagues are a little bit more reticent, encourage and remind them where they came from. They all used to be trainees once. There are a lot of tips in this joint document you can gain, you can find on the JCST website, uh, developed uh, jointly with ASIT and BOTA and the Confederation of Postgraduate Schools of Surgery. It's making the most of every, every training opportunity. How Just some, some, some tips about what to do to help people get back on that trajectory towards CCT. And it's, it's easy again, isn't it? It's exposed trainees to every possible training opportunity and then make some plans. You know, what's happening next week? What should we do? Who's going to go to what? Who needs to do this anterior section? Who needs to do this hernia? And get people to those places. And if you've got an extended team that you work with, make sure that they're doing the things to backfill what the trainees might do to release trainees, to go to outpatients, to go to endoscopy, to go to theatre. And then it's really important, I think, to give better feedback. It's much, you get, you get, you train much quicker by knowing where you are, by knowing what you need to do and do that. You can do it specifically case by case. You don't have to fill in a work-based assessment necessarily. You can just sit down and have a chat afterwards. Or you can do it generally with the MCR and self-assessment. Again, very important for producing bespoke learning plans. And then involve a trainee in all the clinical work. Any trainee can do can get involved in anything. Clinics, ward rounds, emergencies, theatre, MDT, and even paperwork. Every, every single patient is an opportunity for training. 
and adapt your approach to maximize the opportunities. So if you're doing telephone clinics at the moment, then let your trainee do them. It's ideal. You can sit next to them and listen to every word, have it on speakerphone, and you can intervene if needed. But it's a, a fantastic opportunity to train and things like that. Or do the train, let the trainee lead the ward and stand back and watch. You can intervene if there's if there's a problem or something you need to disagree with. But again, let the trainee do it and give feedback afterwards. And then deliver all the training you can in theatre. If you've got two trainees, then if you've got a, a, a more senior and more junior trainee, divide the tasks up accordingly and agree that beforehand. If you've got two consultants, fantastic. You can, you can take it in turns to supervise the trainee. But I think, you know, sort of building on the things that Kirsty said as well is make your trainee feel like they belong on the firm or important to the unit. Your trainees are people. They've been through a lot this year and you need to look after trainees if you're a, a, uh, a trainer or a consultant, because all consultants should be trainers. And if you're a trainee, then look after your consultant. You get the most out of each other. Have regular weekly meetings informally. Go for a coffee and just talk about how things are. Get to know your, get to know each other and make time to meet. And, and you know, when lockdown's over, then you know, resurrect the firm. Do go out, let your hair down a bit. Everybody get to know each other. And, you know, just remember that your trainees are our people. Treat them like people and remember that you were a trainee once if you're a trainer. And a couple of videos expanding on this um, shows I, I used to have shorter hair when barbers are open and I only have one jumper. And two videos are available on the ISCP JCST YouTube site. This is really good. It came from Poppy Redman who's a, a surgeon in New Zealand and uh, she released this through Twitter, you can see it on uh, uh, her email accounts to download and, and put up in your theatre or on our following uh, our no training today, no surgeons tomorrow hashtag and then maybe use this in theatre and it, so one of the things is that you know if, if you come and say well my trainee's going to do this then there's a lot of eye rolling and sighing from theatre staff and the anaesthetist even though the anaesthetist has probably made the biggest dent in your list so list time so far and just make it clear from the start that today we'll be training introduce everybody set the goals list the outline and then do it the time out and then at the end do the wrap up what went well or what could be improved and give some feedback so print that off and, and post it all of your theatres and take it and make it part of the briefing at the start of the day and at the end training in the independent sector there's only about two percent of cases happening in the, in the independent sector but with that four and a half million people waiting for, for for uh, treatment that may go up quite a lot and so um, training in the independent sector can happen um, you can read it there there's again the document is on the JCST website uh, and but it, it's, it's open to everybody in NHS patients uh, trainees have to provide uh, only their uh, ARCP summary and their form are to independent sector no extra patient no extra paperwork no other shilly shallying from the independent sector and you're covered by NHS indemnity, although you should all have other indemnity uh, aside from that. And then train as you do in your NHS hospital are the same patients, they're NHS patients. You've got the same trainee, uh, you supervise them the same, using this exactly the same assessment tools. And if you have problems, then escalate it to your head of school or to the postgraduate dean. If there's any pushback at all from the independent sector, the contracts there, they're obliged to do it. Uh, everything I've talked about is available on uh, this www.jcst.org for those of you who haven't seen it in this section down here on the right from the home base key documents will take you to this page here where all that uh, COVID-19 related uh, paperwork is and guidance from uh, the Canada Medical Royal Colleges, GMC and statutory education bodies lots of other things on there as well it's not, not the most frequently visited website but it's all there for you. COVID's not going to last forever and so we're going to see this soon. It's going to be it's going to be a sunny day again and we're going to come out the other side. So whilst it seems dark now, it is going to get better. The weather gets warmer. The vaccination takes place. We've all done. We just recently had uh, the plan for release from lockdown. But trainees need good trains like never before. How quickly we get trainees back onto the right trajectory towards trade towards CCT really depends on what trainers do. So it's up to you as trainers to get people back there as quickly as possible. They can carry on in this deflected trajectory if we don't do anything. So get people back on trajectory by intervening. Your trainees need you. That's the long and the short of it. Train people, do it well. Remember it was you once. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, John. I'm sure there's gonna be a couple of questions that are all coming through on the chat. Um, Everyone that's uh, participating at the minute, just let me know, we are running slightly over time. 
I think um, if I can borrow another five or 10 minutes, some questions to go to the panel members. Uh, we're just gonna launch the poll that went out prior to the um, webinar starting this evening. While Jonathan Lewis, our EPCON sponsor, uh, prepares to share the screen, if you can, Jonathan. So you can just yeah, go definitely. through some of the EPCON equipment for us. Um, I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the ASGBI to thank EPCON for their, their sponsorship. They're going to be sponsoring a series of webinars right the way through the year, uh, and we're grateful for it. So if people want to just answer the poll just now, if Jonathan can start to share his screen, please. Welcome everybody. My name is Jonathan. I work as the platform manager for Megadyne within Ethicon. Thank you for attending this session. I hope you find it informative. We're going to cover safety in surgery and how Ethicon endeavour to create solutions that align to safety improvements for patients and staff regarding electrosurgery. Historically, Ethicon Energy has been associated with the harmonic scalpel. Amongst other things, it's a means to cut and coagulate tissue, but without the need for an electrosurgical circuit traveling through the patient. As you can see from this slide, Harmonic is accompanied by advanced bipolar NCLX1, as well as traditional monopolar approaches that encompass novel proprietary technologies. It is these technologies I will focus on today in order to address safety in surgery in line with return electrodes, smoke evacuation, and Sharps injuries. With regards to electrode safety and reducing the associated problems with sticky pad types, Megadyne provide a capacitive style reusable return electrode. It lasts for two years and is appropriate for patients above 350 grams, right up to your bariatric patients. The Megasoft pad is comprised of an insulated gel material surrounding a conductive mesh material. When the patient is placed on top, a capacitor is formed since the patient is acting as the second conductive layer. As a result, when the active monopolar electrode contacts the patient, an electrostatic field is created, which allows the current to complete the circuit. Current travels through the electrostatic field and not through the patient. It has a current limiting effect, which eliminates the buildup of high current density and therefore reducing the buildup of heat within the pad which also reduces the chance of burns and surgical fires. It is, as a result, suitable to be used on patients with implants, tattoos and piercings. Ideal for emergency surgery situations amongst many other types of surgery. Here you can see an example of the use with various different patient positionings. It's important to note that 20% of the pad must be covered, but which you can see is very easily achievable. Following on from electrosurgery, we're now going to talk about the topic of surgical smoke or plume. Quite rightly, surgical smoke has recently become an area of interest and debate. Within that very familiar smell are a wide range of particulates that we know to be an occupational risk factor that many healthcare professionals would like to not be exposed to. Surgical smoke can travel up to 18 meters per second. The concentration of the particles can rise from 60,000 particles per cubic foot to over a million particles per cubic foot within five minutes of activation. Of the 150 plus different chemical constituents, it is referenced here the various body systems that are impacted, as well as the various chemicals themselves. It is no surprise that SARS-CoV-2 has caused this added focus on the topic due to the knowledge of other viruses and bacteria that have previously been identified within surgical smoke. The dangers are farther of that beyond just viruses and bacteria. The Megadyne smoke evacuator filter provides the filtration necessary to capture these particulates and is within the range of viruses including SARS-CoV-2. It can serve as another layer in the defense and precautions that you take. As well as the ALS GBI's recognition that smoke evacuation should be used, the MHRA also advise that active smoke evacuation should be used and that employers should carry out an assessment of the risks of plume exposure. The Ethicon Megadyne smoke evacuator 
delivers quiet and effective performance for open and laparoscopic procedures. It comes with a connect cable enabling it to connect and automatically activate on both electrosurgical monopolar generators as well as advanced energy devices for ultrasonic and bipolar needs. All tips come with a PTFE Easy Clean tip which produces 68% less smoke. Having covered return electrodes and smoke evacuation, we're now going to look at a technology that could help to reduce Sharps injuries. The Ethicon Megadyne electrosurgical generator is designed to optimize energy delivery to minimize tissue damage through proprietary software and algorithms. The gem cut mode modulates the power to maintain constant minimum voltage at the surgical site as impedance dynamically changes. Using the minimum voltage allows the user to cut through different tissue types with less thermal damage than standard monopolar electrosurgery. The GEM high mode of the Ethicon Megadyne electrosurgical generator is designed to provide surgical speed and efficiency. The GEM low mode provides approximately half the power of the GEM high and is designed to provide tactile feedback. When combined with GEM mode on the Megadyne electrosurgical generators, the result is a true GEM effect to provide scalpel-like cutting with significantly less damage versus standard monopolar electrosurgery. The GEM blade is available on devices of a telescoping feature, one with smoke evacuation and one without. It has a true scalpel-like cutting effect, less thermal damage and it increases surgical efficiency and also removes sharp injury potential. You can see from this slide, healing comparison of porcine cutaneous incisions made with a cold steel scalpel, standard electrosurgical blade and the GEM technology with the GEM technology being represented by A, the cold steel scalpel being represented by B, and traditional monopolar surgery is C. I hope this has provided context of the range of the Ethicon Megadyne portfolio. If you would like any further information, please contact your Ethicon representative. If indeed you would like to try any of the products you have seen today, either contact your representative or use the links provided from this webinar. So I don't think there are actually any links, okay, but nonetheless I'm here to answer any questions and always you can contact your, your representative as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Jonathan. So I'm mindful of the time everyone, we're going to have three or four minutes of some questions. There's some come through the chat and Vicky's going to bring the poll up for us just shortly. So uh, a question to John and Daniel actually. So we've not discussed nutrition. Do we think that nutrition forms part of uh, both your physical and I suppose your mental health or fitness, I would think. And uh, should there be a provision of fresh water and nutritional food to our healthcare staff? And that's from Lindsay and Sol. Well, absolutely. We should all be hydrated. Um, I'm not sure as surgeons, if you go and dehydrate yourself, so you don't need to visit the lavatory as often. I'm not sure if that's a common practice, but. Um, maybe having a camel pack on your back with a tube coming down so you can drink during the surgery, I don't know. But certainly, um, yeah, we should be aiming to drink two litres of water a day, but um, um, yeah, certainly encouraging uh, good fluid hydration and obviously a balanced diet is all sensible as well. And uh, yeah, I think. Brilliant, thank you. Kirsty, uh, in relation to mindfulness, do you need a quiet room? You're on mute. You can have to unmute for us. You know, absolutely not. There are so many, many myths. Um, if anybody, anybody wants to come to Derby and do a mindfulness course, I'm willing to run one. But um, one of the best practices I ever was taught was uh, on the busy Marlebone Road in London, sat on a, a bench on the side of the road and actually just bringing awareness to the noises that you could hear. So mindfulness should be portable. Wherever you are, there's an opportunity to just do something that just brings the awareness into the moment. Can I just mention one other thing on that, just briefly? Uh, a lot of the time with mindfulness, and particularly if you are feeling a bit anxious and wound up, probably one of the worst things to come to is breath, because actually a lot of the time the breath is, the only reason that's mentioned in mindfulness practice is because it's present, it's happening now. So just finding anything really, just bringing awareness to your feet on the floor, 
but you know birds in the birds in the trees anything like that just something that you can focus on that's happening now fantastic and i follow up to that one are the mindfulness apps any good i think there's quite a few available to download to mobile phone are they yeah, the, the, headspace, the uh, headspace app is actually currently still available for nhs anybody working within the nhs it's free to download um if you work locally or regionally or you have contacts this webinar there's a whole series of mindfulness um resources that we can um, send you that are downloadable we have at our hospital here um, I certainly think you know but to be honest don't pay for anything go on YouTube uh, and, and just find something that's uh, you know uh, off the off the shelf that you can pull off or more importantly probably just do something that's bespoken that works for you uh, Jonathan done on the one for you is there a difference between exercises for men and women they all do the same you're on mute. John, you're on mute. Hi. Jonathan Daniels, you're on mute. Quick, quick answer again, men and women. Sorry, I was. I just said I've never been asked that question before, but um, my response is we should all be doing as, as much exercise and as many different types of exercise as possible. Um, obviously, being pregnant, uh, being a... Uh, woman is pregnant towards the end stages of pregnancy, we need to alter things a little bit differently and change the focus to different types of exercise. Um, but yeah, key, key message is do as, as, much, as much as possible. Should exercise be part of the surgical brief at the start of the operating list? Yeah, let's have a good warm up in the surgery. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a quick always, question. Warm up. A quick question for John Long, which is quite topical after Radio 4's news uh, bulletin this morning. Do you think that the MRCS exam will disappear and it will be trainee and tra or trainer-led assessments? Forward? Uh, not yet, but maybe, maybe in future. I mean, that, that, that could be a, a good long-term plan. We'll, we need to be able to assess knowledge in some form, um, but I think that uh, certain parts of the exam could easily be replaced by um, the, the MCR as a work-based assessment. What we need to do is get more confidence in that as an assessment tool over the next two or three years and then see where we are. But I think that's entirely feasible. We, we, there's probably still going to be some sort of knowledge test. Uh, thank you. So just going back through the poll, I think uh, a couple of people recognised that they probably had more pain than they necessarily thought they would have done. And they Looks like more people have recognised that they've suffered work anxiety related stress than they would have done. Um, I can feel Jill Tierney's stress that I've run 17 minutes over uh, time on my very first webinar being the Director of Emergency Surgery. So apologies in advance. I just want to take an opportunity to advertise our next webinar, which is coming up very shortly on the 1st of April, small bowel obstruction. Uh, Jill's going to time that perfectly and chair it for us. Is how it should be done. We've got Nicola Burnhead, Matt Lee, and Alan, who is the uh, new president of the Moynihan Academy, speaking for us. Thank you to our uh, panel members. Thank you to everybody who's taken part and uh, listened this evening. Like I said, you can find all this information on the members' hub on the way at ASGBI website. Good evening. <laughs>